So what I'm going to talk about today is a series of projects that connect to the central theme of social norms, the emergence of social norms. And the two big questions with social norms are always, you know, where do they come from? How do we sort of form them in the first place? And then once they're formed, they seem to sort of lock in and they're, you know, stable. So once that happens, how do they ever change? Um, and so that question of like, you know, order and then dynamics are the sort of two big parts of the problem. And so this uh, set of projects addresses both. Um, so I'll first talk about kind of the emergence dynamics and then, and then about the, um, the tipping point studies that we did um, build, you know, building on those first studies. And uh, methodologically, one of the interesting things about this is that this work connects um, a series of uh, formal models that were built in, um, in, in collaboration with physicists um, and so sociologists working together to kind of understand the dynamics. Um, and then the experimental data from our first study actually wound up informing the theoretical model that we've been using. Um, and we developed a new model that was based on what we learned. Um, and then that wound up being the sort of um, impetus for doing our second experiments. And so it really articulates a very like productive, kind of re remarkably systematic um, dialogue between formal theory and um, experimentation, uh, which led us to like a, a clearer understanding of the, the fundamental problem. Um, this work is with uh, Andrea Baron Kelly, who's um, a mathematician who's there in London. Um, Joshua Becker is a grad student of mine, Devin Brack is a grad, uh, grad student of mine. Um, Joshua Becker just graduated. He's also got a, a job now at, um, in London, University College London, assistant professor. Devin Brackwell took a job as a senior um, scientist at Facebook. Um, <clears throat> see if I can advance this. Here we go. So um, the sort of basic idea of a tipping point, I think we're all familiar with, you know, these kind of famous quotes from Margaret Mead, like a small, a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Notably, she said that, but there's not, it's not actually quoted in any work of hers, written work of hers. Um, but we all have that intuition, and it's an intuition that goes back for, you know, at least since the 1950s in social science. Um, and then in the, in the uh, 1970s, this idea was really making headway in sociology and economics. Um, Thomas Schelling obviously uh, wrote about, you know, critical mass dynamics. Um, and at the same time, Rosabeth Moss Cantor, um, who was a sociologist uh, at, at HBS, um, started thinking about what the implications were for um, gender dynamics. And this is, a, this is a hugely important problem that we're seeing, you know, kind of latter day realizations of it with the Me Too movement. You know, but her big insight was that the culture of organizations is really sensitive to the kind of fraction of um, women in the organization. That below this sort of critical tipping point, um, women were really treated like, you know, the, the worst that you can imagine. It was like, you know, unequal pay, explicit discrimination, you know, expectations that forced them to exhibit like, you know, overly stylized masculine and feminine behaviors, depending on the situation. Um, and of course, sexual harassment, and sexual assault. You know, um, and what would happen is that if, you know, significant fraction, this was an ethnographic study, so it wasn't as if she had a model or, or like an um, experimental test, but she was able to make this really clear inference that if, you know, a, a critical fraction or what she called a, a tilted group would, uh, would sort of reach um, the upper management or sort of higher echelons in the organization, all of a sudden that would like translate into a change in the organizational culture. So this has been a big idea, obviously, for you know well over 50 years, people thinking about tipping points. And myself and I think hundreds of other people in you know, economics, mathematical sociology, um, uh, political science, and you know, related fields have all tried, any physics, of course, and computer science, have built these mathematical models of tipping points. And we can all kind of study these things in our computers. But then the, the real question is, you know, what, <laughs> What does that mean in real life? Could you actually ever study a, a real tipping point and know for sure that there was a causal effect of reaching a critical mass on changing everyone's behavior? Um, some physicists came along in 2011 and used the same model that we've been using um, to develop this prediction of 10%. Um, so we started kind of playing with that. And then I'll, you know, I'll talk about what the implications are for that model and um, you know, understanding how to make really a, a kind of systematic study of this that leads to a predictive capacity. I know the word prediction is kind of overused today, um, particularly in social science. Oftentimes what people mean is they find uh, strongly correlated variables. And so the, the kind of, you know, the lingua franca in, in statistics is to say, you know, X predicts Y. Um, but what that really means is that, you know, X tends to like co-occur with Y. 
And in terms of a prediction, you know, if you want to know why, why X, you know, co-occurs with Y, um, correlations don't give you any kind of grip on like what the causal mechanism is. And that's important because whenever you really want to do policy, if you want to figure out what causes a change in social behavior, you need to know why and under what circumstances some intervention is going to make a difference. So um, the real goal with figuring out the tipping point is to figure out a way of making like predictions is, you know, are there patterns of collective behavior that we can understand? Um, and then do we really, un do we really sort of uh, believe it in the way that it's been articulated, which is that there's a prediction we can make that if, if a critical mass reaches, you know, this sort of special point, then population behavior will change. And so that's, that's what we're after here is testing that prediction. Um, a brief overview, I'm going to talk about social norms, then of course the experimental approach that um, I've been developing over the last decade, which, uh, yeah, I talked about it in the book, How Behavior Spreads, but it's also, you know, kind of infused all the other work that um, I've been doing uh, over the last 10 years. Um, the predictions that we came up with, testing them, and then what the real big implications are of those, of those sort of findings. Um, so when you start with quantifying social norms, um, you know, we began just by thinking, and there's a vast literature on social norms. The, the word itself is overused and um, overdetermined, right? So uh, just to kind of maybe prevent this question from derailing us later, or we can talk about it if people like to, but it's not a hugely interesting question. What is a social norm? Um, you know, it, it's people are typically formalize this game theoretically. So I formalize it in terms of social coordination, which means that basically a social norm is a situation where you have expectations of me, and I have expectations of you. And the point is that these expectations are formed dynamically. Um, if I see how you're reacting to me and uh, it seems a little off, then I'll adjust my behavior, um, kind of calibrate it to how you're, how you're acting. And if you don't like that, then you'll adjust your behavior further to change how I'm acting. And we're kind of figuring out um, how we get along with each other and what, what's expected of each other. Um, and this language is the quintessential example of this, right? We tend to figure out what words to use and what's effective and what's ineffective. But this is kind of the Wittgensteinian model in the sense that it's, you know, it's basically a pragmatic process of trying to figure out what works. Um, and uh, so in sociology, we talk about descriptive norms, which means, you know, basically what's everyone doing if you were to describe like average behavior. Um, then there's, of course, injunctive norms, which means you know, what do people think other people should do? So injunctive norms notice transitions from a description of what everyone's doing, so it's a population level observation, to a description of what people think in their heads. Um, and that is a, it's casually done, but it's a really big move actually, because speculating about what's going on in people's heads when you see their behavior is a really tricky business. Um, and ever since this, you know, original work on critical mass stuff, particularly Granovetter's 1978 paper, it's been really clear that you can't make inferences about what's going on in people's heads from what the group is doing. Um, and so what that does is it leads us in a place where we're trying to figure out how to make sense of this process and whether or not people cognize it explicitly this way. Um, these sorts of behaviors, which are also sometimes called conventions in the literature, like by David Lewis and others, um, really are a process of social coordination. Um, and the really interesting thing is that once these norms are established, once everyone's kind of doing them, you can think of anything like, you know, the norm of shaking hands and you're a stranger, or, you know, we, I'm sure this will come up in the question and answer, but the norm of wearing a face mask, right? Once the norm is established and everyone's doing it, um, you know, right now we're in a point of transition with face masks, but if you look at the norm of shaking hands, like it just seems like everyone shakes hands. That's like the way it's been. There's, you know, even a sense of etiquette around how to shake a hand properly. And, you know, it seems uh, proper in the sense that it could not have been any other way. There's a kind of this counterfactual disbelief. And so norms take on this moral quality, like it's the right way to do things. Um, but then my work and a lot of other people, um, but particularly in the study in 20, uh, 2005 called the emperor's dilemma, I looked at this question of, you know, what happens when norms are really bad and nobody wants them? They can nevertheless take over. And that's, you know, it's called the emperor's dilemma. It's a situation where everybody knows the emperor is naked and nevertheless, everyone enforces everyone else's claim and belief and attestation that the emperor has beautiful clothes on. So how does it happen that we all wind up coordinating and, and enforcing each other to exhibit behaviors that none of us even want? Um, and so what that means is that the kind of classic economic argument, and Ken Arrow is kind of preeminent proponent of this, that what norms are, are just kind of solutions to social dilemmas. 
It's like, no, sometimes norms are themselves social dilemmas. And so the question is, how does this process happen if it's not just because it's like the right or best thing to do? There must be some other social explanation of how norms take hold and, of course, how they change. Um, so one of my best, you know, my favorite examples of this is um, in Sweden, uh, many of you must know this, that in Sweden in, um, in the 1960s, they were you know, a left-hand uh, driving nation and they wanted to switch to being a right-hand driving nation to sort of coordinate with the rest of Europe. Um, and, so, and so this is a question that, <laughs> topic that will be relevant to everyone there who <laughs> lives in England. Um, but they were trying to figure out how to change the country. And so they did, is they made a huge announcement. It's been, um, years, you know, with public radio announcements that this day, September 3rd, 1967, would be H-Day or haagen -Dazs. And that would be the day that um, they would um, switch the entire country um, to uh, right-hand side driving. Um, and they, you know, re what they did, which is actually remarkable, it's only something a small and really wealthy nation can do. They, from 1 a.m. to 6 a.m. on September 3rd, they shut down all the streets, they took down all the road signs, they repainted all the roads. There's, it was, you know, it was like post-apocalyptic. There was nothing um, for like five hours. And then they put up all new road signs, repainted the streets, um, and then at 6 a.m. reopened the roads. And everyone knew the rules. I mean, they, you know, they've been advertising it and there were signs and posters. There was even like Swedish H-Day underwear. There was everything. There was a pop song on the radio, played for a year. Like everyone knew it was H-Day. Everyone knew they were supposed to drive on the right. So given that, and given our kind of belief that, you know, norms are often just enforced from the top down, um, you know, this is what happened, which is to say, just because everyone knows what the rule is, doesn't mean anyone can coordinate with each other. Because the really big issue with coordination is not what everyone in the world or everyone in the country is doing, it's what the people on your particular block are doing. Particularly if you're driving on a country road on that morning, September 3rd, you know, at like 6.30 or 7 a.m. and you see a he pair of headlights coming towards you, like everyone else in the country may be driving on the right, but all you care about is whether that pair of headlights is gonna drive on the right. And if they start to swerve even a little bit, you lose uh, an ability to know what they're gonna do. You can't predict their behavior. And, and then they start to feel like they can't predict your behavior. And all of a sudden this coordination uh, problem um, winds up preventing uh, uh, everything. And so the entire country of Sweden was like, you know, a mess for a couple of weeks. Um, and so this really gets at what I think is that kind of the crucial thing in studying norms and coordination dynamics, which is that global information doesn't really help us in these problems. It's really about people interacting with other people and knowing what to expect in those interactions. And so that's how we need to study it. We need to study a process where you have people interacting with other people and trying to figure out what to expect from them. So we developed a, a very simple model of coordination. This is based on what was called um, the naming game model. Um, so basically, and again, as I mentioned, the kind of the major intellectual lineage here goes, goes back to Hume and then Wittgenstein and then um, David Lewis. But the idea is that there's this kind of pragmatic process. Um, two people see an object and they both need to come up with a way to identify, they just need to communicate. And so they both just sort of shout a, a name, like that's a, a blah. Um, and if they coordinate, great, then they can figure out how to move stuff around. This is Wittgenstein's famous slab language. Um, they can sort of, you know, get work done. But if they miscoordinate, they don't really have any idea what they're each talking about. So you need to kind of go back and forth. It. And a lot of studies have shown that two people can figure this out if you give them enough time just by trial and error. Um, the question, of course, that we're interested in is how the country of Sweden figures it out or how, you know, entire populations figure it out when we don't all interact with each other. Right? We interact with small segments of the population and they interact with other small segments and so on and so forth. So the network structure actually controls this process of coordination. It makes it very complicated because you may interact with some neighbors who are engaging one behavior, but your other neighbors may engage in a different one. So how does, you know, sort of population-wide uh, coordination emerge? Um, one of the important things, this is just kind of a methodological side note, and it's apropos of the topic of the seminar, um, which is large-scale experiments is that this problem of coordination and emergence of linguistic norms in particular has been studied forever. Um, but most people studied it have used classic labs. They've used you know, brick and mortar labs. So it turns out, and this is where the connection between modeling and experiments is crucial. It turns out the dynamics, um, there's a sort of a critical point in the, in the collective dynamics of coordination and specifically of these naming game dynamics, 
where the network structure below a certain size, below n equals about 20, um, doesn't affect qualitatively the dynamics. Regardless of the structure, everything goes in the same direction. But above a critical size, and the critical size for this particular model is about 20, um, the dynamics diverge and actually go in opposite directions. And so what that means is that if you'd spent you know, a career studying groups under the size of 20, you would derive a whole set of conclusions that would not generalize to groups over the size of 20. And of course, since we're interested in is any kind of large scale process, whether it's in like a, you know, a county, a state or a federal level, um, ultimately we're interested in the n greater than 20 case, which means that we need to study the n greater than 20 case to understand how those dynamics actually work. And so this is one of the main things that motivates large scale experiments and internet experiments because it affords us the possibility to test our models in sort of the regimes, the dynamical regimes that are most relevant to their application. All right, experiments on norms. So I wanna start with this, um, this little video here, which uh, basically is an articulation of the dynamics of um, people interacting. Of course, it's fish interacting, but the question is if you were to measure each, each of these 20,000 fish one at a time um, and get perfect brain scans of them all, could you ever make the inference that they would do this when you put them all together? Which is to say, could you understand the collective behaviors they would create, the dynamics that would make those behaviors more cohesive or the dynamics or interventions that would disrupt those behaviors just by observing these fish one at a time? And of course the answer is no. To understand the schooling process, you have to study schooling. Um, and my view is that it's the same for human behavior, um, which is that you simply cannot you know, by studying people one at a time or in very small groups, figure out what large populations will do or what those dynamics will look like, how they'll unfold in time, and what's going to disrupt or um, promote them. And so that kind of leads me to this approach, the sort of experimental sociology, web-based social dynamics approach. Um, and the idea here for me, I mean, the models and the kind of theoretical approach I use is uh, highly um, uh, dependent uh, on physics. That's kind of my background. But the methodological experimental approach I use is owes more to biology. Um, the, I've always been impressed by this notion of a petri dish and the way that, you know, diseases like penicillin could be systematically shown to grow under certain conditions and not under others. And that always seemed to me like the right metaphor for thinking about what we're doing with an experiment, where we're basically saying we can sort of take a population and then you know, alter one feature of that population. And as a result, you will grow, and you know, forgive the pun, but you'll grow cultures that are distinct or that we just wouldn't show up you know, in the first population. And methodologically, that seems to me like that's the, the grail, or at least you know, from the kind of work I do, the kind of micro macro collective dynamics uh, work, that is exactly the, sort of the ambition of this science is to be able to study that process systematically. Um, and, you know, the most important part of this is replication is that if you can do this once, it's amazing. You can show that there's, you know, this difference, but if you can replicate that with like series of Petri dishes where you're showing that, you know, you can systematically and predictably generate a, a collective behavior in one case that doesn't show up just because one simple um, mechanism has been changed, then you've truly identified what the causal relationship is between that collective behavior and this sort of social intervention process. So um, the game we built was um, built, you know, based uh, really on our model. Um, and the model, you know, remember I said two people look at an object and they try and name it. Um, I thought long and hard about what kind of game people should play. And again, methodologically, um, I talked for people who know more about this. The, there's a chapter in the in the How Behavior Spread books that a uh, book that like details my thinking process when building an experiment. It kind of goes into this, like the kinds of decisions you make, what you know, what to do and what not to do. Because there's a, you know, it takes a long time, like a year or two to come up with like the right design. Um, in this case, I really think that there's tremendous value in internet experiments because so many people are doing real social behaviors online in taking the time to build something that's actually a real social behavior, something fun, something people like to do, something that's, you know, natural them um, so that even though they're an experiment you're it's like more like a field experiment you're studying a real thing um, and so people often do this kind of game at parties where they try to look at people and guess their names because certain certain people look more like an x or a y than other people 
Um, and then there's also this game, there was an ESP game, right? Where people would look at an object and both try to guess what it was. Uh, there are these sort of popular behaviors that people would uh, engage in um, that are very natural to people. They're fun, they're recreational. And so the idea was to take that idea um, and to put it into an experimental context where people were doing the same natural thing. Like you and I would look at this and we'd be partnered together. And we'd only, you know, in this list, let's say there were 20 people in the game. You have like a subset of people on the left. And, uh, and I would match, you know, in every round, um, two people together. So if there's, you know, 20 people in the group, then um, I'm gonna have 10 pairs. And then you would just see the person, in, uh, or rather, you would just be matched with one of these people, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't know whom. Um, and then uh, you two would both try to guess the name or make up a name, I guess. Uh, and then after the round was over, you would see what name your partner had put in. They would see what name you put in. So there could be social learning. Um, but you were, this is the crucial part of the study. And this was to me, one of the most important parts of the design was that you were rewarded um, only if you match names. But if you didn't match names, we actually took money away from you, right? So it wasn't easy. And I think that's a huge part people miss about these experiments is that everyone tries to make it like, I mean, you know, simple and stupid is good. And this is simple and stupid. So that's a useful thing. Um, but they try to make it like really low barrier and people actually enjoy a challenge. You know, again, part of making it fun is not making it trivial. So, um, so you know, I thought of it kind of like a carnival game. Like, yeah, it's, of course you're going to get it wrong the first time. You know, how, what's the, what are the chances you're both going to guess the same name? Um, but then it kept people really engaged because if they ever got lucky and, and matched on a name with someone, then, then the next interaction was going to be with somebody else. And so they, it created this kind of tension of like they could lose the money they just won. And people hate losing money, right? So it really keeps people engaged in this process. Um, and it also makes sure they'll stay through the whole study, like because you want people to stay, you know, through several rounds of doing this. And part of the part of the motivation is that if you if you dial out, you know, you're you'll just lose all of the money as you know as the rounds keep going and you're not playing. Um, and if you stay in there and stay engaged, then like you can keep making money every single round. Um, and Im importantly, again, people aren't paid for showing up, and that's just a principle in all of my studies. I never pay people for showing up because. Um, it's the wrong incentive um, because in, you know, it's like giving a, you know, nobody plays a, a championship match for a participation trophy, right? You pay it, you play a championship match because you want like the championship trophy. So you have to give people credit that like they're there to do this task and to do well at it um, and not just say, well, here's some money for trying. Um, so I think that that's kind of the, the basic um, idea. All right, I'm going to move on to the results because that's sort of the fun part. So this is, we looked at two network structures. There's a, a lot of, I didn't want to go into that here because it's a lot of, um, yeah, it's nice mathematical detail, but it's, I wanted to talk more about the experiments than about the theoretical setup. Um, the, the basic theory is look in a, in a this is um, 24 people. These are, this is actual data. I'm going to play you data. This isn't a simulation, it's not, right? These are the actual data. And the beautiful thing about doing these kind of online experiments is that when you design them well, um, and I, I'll admit that design takes a year or two to get it right, but when you design it well, you don't need to do a lot of like terribly fancy statistics because the data are just really clear. You either get a behavioral phenomenon out of it or you don't. Um, so this is 24 people. When they, um, they're, and we're, I'm matching them, um, in these kind of pairwise fashion. So each person's connected in kind of a, a lattice network. So each person is connected to two people next to them. And you'll see that the network will fill in as the, as the data video play. And you'll see people interacting with their peers, their immediate neighbors. Uh, but this means that basically everyone, even though there's a network of 24 people, everyone only interacts with four people total. So they just keep cycling through those same four in random fashion. Um, and if they match on a name, um, they both turn the same color, which is the color of that name. And I'll show you a histogram will appear up here on the right hand side. And you'll see all the names that people are using and the size, it's a real histogram. So the size of the bar of the color next to the name is actually how many people are using it. So you can see the growth and popularity of different names. Um, and the line between two people will show up white if they both try different names um, and fail to coordinate, but it will show up the color of the name if they succeed in coordinating. Um, so this is how it starts. So you can see right away, you have the name Sarah, Rebecca, Emma, Ashley, Lisa, Samantha, and so forth. Um, 
the name Sarah is green. Um, you can see uh, here, here, and here. That name appeared independently in the network, right? Um, and then you can also see this name here, which is uh, Lisa, I believe, has also appeared independently because these are the only interactions that have happened. But what's interesting is as people start to interact, you start to see these like little clusters of culture forming. Um, you can see there's kind of a Sarah group at the top and at the bottom, there's this Elena group forming. Um, and so there's this little kind of bits of coordination taking place. And so that looks really promising. It looks like very quickly, you know, you've got coordination off the ground. It should lead to sort of some kind of global coordination process. Um, I also want to know that people did things like you'd expect. It's, it's real behavior. People could put it whenever they wanted to do it. When I first ran this, um, I think I was at MIT. So there were a bunch of MIT students in it and like, you know, people on the mailing list. And um, uh, they typed in like code. I mean, they pasted it in. So it was like, you know, 1600 lines of code or something, which didn't show up very nicely in this you know, um, graphic. But um, it didn't do any, obviously no one's going to coordinate on that. But the point is like people put in whatever they wanted to put in. Um, and some people typed and you can see down here, someone typed in gorgeous, someone typed in sexy, someone typed in beautiful. Uh, and that's interesting in some ways uh, because, right, those aren't names, those are adjectives. And, it, and you can think of that as like a clever solution because, and blue eyes also up there, right? Because we don't have to agree on a name at that point. We just agree they have blue eyes and then we can all coordinate. But those solutions, didn't actually affect anything. I think mean, this is pretty interesting because, um, you know, in our simulations, you can't, you know, in the model, you, you don't have this idea of people just, you know, trying to kind of game the system by typing in categories, but that didn't actually work at all. Um, the behavior was pretty much just like you would see in the model. All right, so how did it evolve? So you, um, a couple of interesting things about studying these kinds of processes. Uh, you can see this name, Deborah, right? So now, so a question is like, well, did Deborah um, appear spontaneously or had it sh you know, shown up somewhere else and then kind of propagated, but even though these people weren't using it anymore, now it shows up here. And you'll see this a couple of times where names like Emma, eventually because these people, like this person is surrounded by other people saying um, Samantha and Elena, like that person may give up on uh, Emma. But now this person has heard Emma and they might try it later on. That person might, that person might. So now you have situations like this where a person is trying a name that was tried elsewhere in the network. So basically propagated, but unlike a diffusion process, um, there's no record of that propagation, right? It's like everyone's doing a new culture now, but that like cultural element has sort of spread. Um, and so when we think of things like the spread of writing or the spread of different kind of phonetic uh, phonemes, um, yeah, you have these interesting cases where there's these intermediary paths that it might take, and then it might show up again somewhere else, even though the intermediary path has been reduced by like further cultural evolution. Um, and what you finally see is that even though there are lots and lots of names being suggested, you kind of see a, um, the system settling down into this kind of metastable state where you've got like pretty solid groups. You know, you've got like, an, you've got the Sarah group at the top, you've got this Elena group at the bottom, and now you've got the Samantha group kind of competing um, with, the, with the Sarah group. And what's interesting about this is this, this state, the spatial network, um, doesn't lead in, in, in you know, reasonable, I think the scaling is like with N. It's like, it, it's very, very slow, ultimately with time, um, with noise and infinite time, any, you know, every model converges with noise. But, you know, in terms of like on a realistic time scale or time scale that's like less than N, um, this, this system doesn't converge. It basically locks into these sort of culturally distinct groups. And what's so interesting about that is when you, th you look at features of cultural identity historically, you know, features like, uh, there's probably things like this in Britain. I know the US case better, but in, in the US we have like regional definitions for um, soda. So some people call it soda, which I do from the East Coast, but other people call it pop, other people call it cola. Um, and those things are really regionally entrenched. Like they actually define you as from a certain area. And when culture uh, scholars talk about that or study, they typically talk about it as a, uh, you know, as a feature of identity, something people are proud and kind of self-conscious about. And what's so interesting about this is that this shows that like this is a geographic network and these, these boundaries and these sort of differences in culture just emerge as like a pure structural feature, even though no one is self-conscious, no one can kind of see the landscape and no one even really knows that these other groups have formed. 
um, suffice it to say, we don't get the emergence of a global social norm. So this doesn't answer the question we set out to, you know, to answer about how, how social norms kind of um, take hold of a population. So now we look at a, a kind of globally connected network. And this is um, uh, where we're doing the same pairing process, but instead of just meeting with the four people next to you, you're, you're kind of interacting randomly with everyone. Um, and what you'll see, first of all, is that the number of names that get, <laughs> that get uh, introduced, for that first one's a female face, this one's a male face. We ran the experiment. You'll see there's a lot of replications and we used you know, both genders, um, people of different races and so on and so forth. So we varied the, the face that we used and didn't, none of that affected the dynamics. Um, and uh, you can see just a ton of names show up immediately. And partly what's going on here, uh, the dynamics are really clear uh, in the paper on this. Um, so, all right, so what happens here as this evolves um, is that eventually you can see that the name John starts to take over. And then what very quickly happens is that once John sort of gains what is ostensibly a critical mass, it just kind of explodes throughout the network. Right, and what's interesting about this case is that in this network, there are more names that are suggested, um, which is to say, people are like working harder to figure out whatever, you know, the coordination equilibrium is gonna be, um, and, you know, kind of struggling to get it right. But uh, even though there's more names there, nevertheless, coordination happens much more effectively. So this, I mean, tells us something pretty striking. Now, what's most interesting about this for me, and this is, this is the, the part of the, the science that I love, um, is that, of course, you know, we had spent a couple of years building this theoretical model before we built an experiment to test it. So you have, um, you know, the experimental data in row one, and you have the, the theory, the, the model data in row two. Um, and what you see is that, like, it's not just qualitatively similar, it's really a dead-on match. Like the dynamics are the same dynamics. And that gives you a lot of confidence when you're thinking about like what, you know, what are we actually studying? Are we studying this process the way that we thought we were? But to me, the most important thing, and I, I can't stress this enough, the most important thing with, with experimental science is replication. And um, I fear that we do a lot, of, a lot of data collection these days, and we have historically in, in, in sociology, um, that isn't replicated or well replicated. So. That's just a kind of um, kind of a mantra for me and for actually all the folks in my lab too. That like, you know, if it's not replicated, you really don't know what you found. Um, but we exp we replicated this six times, and the the data were beautiful. And one of the nice uh, this came out in this was in the proceedings. This was in PNAS, the Proceedings of the National Academy, in 2015, um, and it was submitted through like two sections. It was submitted through physics and and social science, um, and so we got reviewers from both. And my colleague, Andrea, is a physicist. And it was just he and I working on this paper, or he's a mathematician, but he's you know, working as a physicist. And um, he, uh, he thought this was really funny that I was worried about a p-value, right? Because, uh, you know, I was like, we have to, you know, do the, the you know, the standard test and show, you know, non-parametric assumptions, you know, what Cox and test look, it's a p of less than a one. And, and he said, yeah, you know, put that if you want to, but like, look at it. <laughs> you know? And I think that that's, it's a really, it's a really different way of thinking than like social scientists and physical scientists. Cause you know, physical scientists are so like, yeah, you can always get a ton of data and get a little p value, who cares, you know, but like the qualitative signal is what matters. And particularly physicists think like this. And I, I think that's a pretty compelling argument that like, even if you had, you know, like a nice p value, but data that were messy, you'd be like, I'm not sure what you really showed there. But it's the, it's the compelling dynamics that you're getting like, massive coordination with this rapid takeoff process, which dynamically is exactly what we predict. Now, um, Sandeep, I took the slide out of here. There's a very cool slide on this kind of, um, the, this kind of quorum sensing kind of collective coordination dynamic and actually what's happening with the distribution when it shifts. Um, it's, it's cool because it's a phenomenon that actually has been identified at the subatomic level but it's never been seen with humans. And this is actually, th this kind of rapid takeoff process you're seeing here um, is actually this kind of really predictable um, phenomenon that only happens with, with certain kinds of coordination dynamics. Um, anyway, that's in the paper too. So we can talk more about that, but I'm gonna skip that for the talk. Um, but so one of the other things that we should think about when we do experiments, and again, this is kind of the methodological side notes point, is, is scaling. So remember I told you that the theory says, look, above 20, these dynamics generalize to you know, 100 billion, so you don't have to worry about it. But 
you know, as a scientist, you, you say, well, it's nice that the theory says that, but I want to make sure the dynamics actually do work that way. Um, and so we ran a bunch of replications that n equals 24, and the thing worked perfectly. And we said, okay, well, let's, you know, let's double the size. And that introduces some like logistic challenges. The game will take longer. It takes more rounds. You know, will people drop out? And what wound up happening is we ran it and it worked just the same. Um, N equals 48 worked the same. And so with that, we felt really comfortable. We had a paper, we had the P less than one result. You know, we had everything we needed to submit. Um, and then you get this kind of, uh, you know, this excited tension in science where, you know, you have what you need to submit the paper, but you're curious. You're like, what would happen if we doubled the size again? What would happen, you know, and mathematically in terms of the theory, we already know what should happen. It'll behave just like before. But anything can go wrong with like a hundred people interacting simultaneously over like now we're talking about a lot of rounds to get everyone interacting. Um, will it really work the same way? And would the reasons it failed be some other like random unrelated reasons to our theory? Um, and also, most importantly, we had the data we needed and they were all clean and clear and consistent. What if we collect data that are N, you know, N96 and, uh, and things break for some reason we don't know? Then we need to, then we need to say that because we actually collected those data. Whereas now, if we don't collect those data, we, we can just get away with saying like it should generalize. Um, so it's this sort of ethical thing that comes up for all scientists. And I think the right thing to do is just to, you know, just to go for it. Um, so we ran the study again and we got the same result again. And that's just, that's incredibly exciting because that is what should happen. And it did happen. And, it, you know, and it's just kind of icing on the cake at that point. It doesn't really affect anything theoretically or with the presentation, even empirically, it doesn't really affect anything. But it's really satisfying to know that like you can, you can push it that hard and it'll, it'll work out as, it, as you expect. Um, so the next question is, we see these kind of collective dynamics in fully connected networks and that, you know, can we ask a question about the tipping point? And in a longer talk, there's a whole discussion here about all the interesting things with tipping points and, and social change. But I'm just going to go right to the kind of meat of this uh, methodologically. So um, the, the, the model that we used, the original model, um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, had a prediction that, that uh, once um, a norm was established and everyone was coordinating our behavior, the 10% would be enough to sort of trigger a tipping point and shift everyone to a new behavior. Um, we weren't seeing that in our data. Uh, if you look, if you look back at the data, um, even with um, even with an established, uh, or even without a norm, a norm hadn't been established yet. This was just the beginning. That these these uh, critical mass dynamics didn't take off until like around there was just 20 20 percent, a little above 20 percent. And so the idea that like 10 percent would be enough to overturn an existing norm just seemed completely it wasn't what we were seeing empirically and so we were led into this kind of um interesting spot scientifically where our model had done a beautiful job of predicting exactly what we found in the data but there was this other prediction coming out of our model that seemed to like not fit at all and that so that was the next question to fig, you know to figure out it's like why why does that tipping point prediction seem so wrong um so in the model we had used originally, and this is again, based on the, the kind of the classic naming game model. So two people look at an object, they try to come up with a way to identify it. Um, they try to communicate. And the way the model worked was that if you succeeded, you would keep using that. But if you failed, you would just look back over your history of past, like you saw Jennifer, Kelsey, you know, um, Samantha, so on. And you looked over these past, uh, you know, kind of index or vector of names. Um, and then you would just choose one randomly because that's what, a, that's what a, a model does, right? A model has no reason for choosing one name as opposed to another. But humans aren't like that. They don't just choose a name randomly. Like there's some kind of process going on, a social process. Um, so we actually went to economics and we started looking at this kind of um, best response model. And this is consistent with, we were also thinking about this first at the time in the, con in the context of complex contagions. And like, you know, there's clearly some social reinforcement dynamics going on to get when one takes off and everything else fails, there's some, some social reinforcement that's making that take, take off. And we could see that at the, at the population level, we wanted to understand that individually. So um, the best way of doing that using this best response model was to say, well, what's going on really is when people look over their past history of plays, they're not choosing randomly over that history. They're basically choosing the one that's the best response. So in, in essence, they're choosing the one that is most socially reinforced in their recent history. 
and saying that's the one most likely to succeed in the future. And so this is how the kind of the complex contagions logic really helped inform our thinking about this um, social coordination model and and um, and the emergence of norms. So we, we the interesting thing, and this is the most striking thing, is we put that one, it's a simple, it's actually a trivial change to the model. You just change it from random to best response. Um, it's a couple of lines of code, but it, it, you can see how dramatically it affected the prediction, right? The prediction like more than doubled. Um, and to me, that's incredibly striking because that, that was unexpected, that it shifted 25%. And that we all got really excited when we saw this because all we did was put in a best response model and it predicted now a, a quantitative value that looked really good compared to the data we were seeing. We were seeing around 20, just above 20% is where those, um, those, the group, the names that won started to take off and take over the population. All right, so um, there's a bunch of different popu uh, parameters you can look at um, with this kind of study. Um, so one is, of course, population size. The other is the size of the memory, which is, say, the size of the vector people use when they look back over their history of past plays. And then there's resistance, which is, you know, people in the population, we're, we've been assuming one-to-one, -one, which is, you know, I just want to coordinate. But it could be the case that, you know, and I think it often is, that people are irrationally committed to something, even when you can think of like the fist bump and the handshake, right? Even when, you know, it's like the, the fist bump is kind of starting to catch on, people are still like, no, a handshake is the right and formal thing to do. Um, and so you can explore with resistance. So these are different kind of parameters. Now, what the, what the committed minority is, is simply this. What is the size of the activist group that's required in order to turn over the existing norm. So if you have 24 people in a population and they're all saying Mia, everyone's agreed that Mia is the name. Um, how many people need to show up and start saying Elizabeth before everyone else comes along, right? And so if we do a kind of really kind of good old fashioned equilibrium analysis and assume it's just, you know, uh, a kind of um, representative actor model, then we'd say, oh, well, basically 51% because you need like a majority to change everybody else, right? And so the tipping point hypothesis, the big claim that, you know, Cantor's making and that, um, uh, that Margaret Mead are, are making uh, is that a minority group like around 20 to 30 percent, or in this case, you know, 25 percent is our prediction, could come in, aggressively start saying Elizabeth, and get the rest of the people, the 75 percent, to all go along and say Elizabeth, right? And then, so that's the thesis. So our committed minority is like, they're not going to be swayed. They're going to say Elizabeth no matter what, right? But the question is, are they going to have any impact whatsoever on anyone else? And you remember where we started before was with the physicists saying 10% would be, you know, enough. Um, and so that's the concept of a committed minority, which is basically your activist group who's like committed to change. And the question is, do they make a dent at all on the rest of the population? So, you know, I'm going to skip over this, of course, because this is not the experiment. But, you know, we, of course, studied systematically with the model, with our new model. Um, what the variations in the prediction are for population size, memory size, and resistance. And, you know, it changed, based on these parameters, it can change a little bit. Like, you know, the, the, obviously the parameters of the empirical situation matter. But for the empirical setting that we're dealing with here, um, we, we were, 25% uh, was right on the money for the sort of the expectation for the tipping point should be. Um, we did, an, uh, this experiment had 10 communities, it's the same exact setup as before. Um, it's a two-part experiment. So, of course, the first part is, the study you just saw. So we start people off, we let them all coordinate endogenously. They all come to agree on a norm. So they're all saying Mia and they just produce that by themselves. And then once everyone was locked in, then we introduce our activists. So our activists are, you know, people use different terms. They call them confederates. Some people use bots. Um, I use grad students. <laughs> they're all the same. <laughs> for, 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 the, for this situation, they're all the same thing. Um, so, uh, so we range from 17% to 31%. Now, 17% is well above 10%, right? So if the physicists are right, then like pretty much every single trial should produce a switch in the social norm. Um, if we're right, basically half the trials should fail and um, half the trials should succeed. And if we're wrong in the sense it doesn't work at all, then you know everything should fail. 
right? So this gives us, you know, really clear predictions for what we should expect. So essentially here, this is just, it's a very simple graph. It's saying, okay, if you plot the size of the committed minority against like the expected impact, our prediction is the red line. And because the, the population is so small, there's some noise. So that air, that gray line is like our 95% um, confidence interval. And the, the dashed line is at 25% perfectly. Um, as the population size gets larger and larger, so around a thousand people, the, the gray line condenses perfectly and the red line shifts and it just goes straight to 20. It's basically 24.2% sort of thing. Um, but so this is what we're looking at for our empirical case. Uh, so we ran 17%. Remember, this is below the predicted tipping point. And what you get is basically nothing, which is striking, right? Because that means the physicists were really not on the money, right? So they predicted 10% was enough. And with 17%, you're getting like zero impact, which is actually, if you think about it, that, that's actually, um, it's surprising because that's 70% of the population who are every single round saying, Elizabeth, 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 and no one is, everyone's just ignoring them, right? So this is really, this is kind of the claim of, of, of the, the tipping point studies, which is that below a tipping point, you basically have no impact, um, even though you can be like a legitimate size, of the, or like a non-trivial fraction of the population. 19% um, had very little impact, Again, 19% very little impact, 20% no impact, and 21% very little impact. So with this five trials, all below 25%, um, on average, the, there was about 6% of the population, the other guys who were listening, and that was it. Like it didn't do anything to change the, the and 20% is actually a lot, and it had you know no effect on anything. And then of course, and this is the magic of a tipping point, because you know, if you go from 10% to 17 to 21, those are big, you know, changes and they're not having any effect. So why should going from 21 to 25 make any difference? It's just like a 4%, you know, percentage point increase. Um, but it had this huge effect. So you go to 25% and all of a sudden the norm tips. Um, with 27% it works, with 28% it works, with 28% again it works, and with 31% it works. Um, and so what you get is this, again, and again, Andrea was a colleague on this paper too, and he was like, I don't understand why you're doing P values, right? It's, you get this really clear effect where it's like you have this dramatic success and dramatic failure right above and below, like right above and below this tipping point. So it's just very, it's very compelling. So this was in science in 2018. Um, and one of the kind of cool things I thought was that one of these groups had uh, only 20 people in it. So the 20% and the 25% was one person, right? It's four committed minority versus five committed minority. And that, that's pretty striking if, you know, the question of like, can one person make a difference? And it's like, yeah, if you're right on the cusp of a tipping point, one person actually can be the difference in this sort of, in this kind of phenomenon. Um, so what, what Margaret Mead said is never doubt that a small group of thoughtful committees has changed the world. Um, this was got picked up. This actually got covered a lot, right? So science has its own press machines. This stuff goes out everywhere. So the Atlantic did a nice job of covering and they actually did an, you know, the press is always difficult, so I think they do a bad job of like, getting an accurate take, but they actually did a pretty reasonable and um, uh, fidelis um, representation of like, theoretically, we were doing Rosamund uh, Moss Cantor's work and building this notion of tipping points out of our theory of critical mass. And this study was really great. But then what happens is that catches on and the news spreads um, and it turns into what is ostensibly fake news. So this made it all the way to Russia and the the Google Translate version of the Cyrillic is scientists have found out people necessary to organize successful revolution. So I just want to be clear, I have no idea how to organize a successful revolution. Our study was about tipping social norms. Um, and so, uh, the, you know, I think that more appropriate quote would be actually Cantor's quote, which is that with an increase in relative numbers, minority members can form coalitions and it's contingent on structural factors, right? And that, that's what we found. Um, I think that I'll wrap the talk up from there. Yeah, there's some, there's yeah. Some, yeah, there's some kind of cool, one cool implication here is that we ran this study because people were saying, well, you ran, you know, the names you got, the names you tried, but we ran this study where it's a white male face and we, we put in a, you know, kind of minority. You can try to guess what the red, green, blue, and purple names are, but actually uh, Eric, Sean, Hans were all doing pretty well, but our committed minority is able to make Nia the name that everyone coordinated on which is interesting because it really kind of, it sort of starts to push out beyond this question of like, okay, people can coordinate on conventions to really talking about norms, things that like we might resist initially, but ultimately we'll coordinate on if there's enough social pressure. 
Um, so with that, thank you very much.